Hey guys. All right. So in this lecture, we're going to finish up chapter two and uh, take a look at the layout of the brain and the different areas within the brain that are specialized for different tasks. And some of you might notice that my background here is a little bit different than in the first couple of recorded lectures that you guys have seen. Those first couple of lectures were recorded several months ago before the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, and now I'm continuing the recording of my lectures uh, now that I'm in home quarantine due to the situation that we're all familiar with. So now you guys are seeing my home office, uh, which you guys are probably gonna be seeing for the foreseeable future in these recorded lectures. So let's go ahead and get these chapter two slides pulled up. All right, you guys should be seeing a full screen view of the chapter two slides. If that's not the case, I apologize. Okay, so last time in the last recorded lecture, we talked about the structure and function of the neuron. And the neuron, of course, is the basic unit of function within the central nervous system. It's the basic building block of the nervous system. And if you miss that, I suggest that uh, you go back and review the material on the neuron. Look at the lecture that I recorded on that. Read the chapter, because uh, in order to understand how the brain works at a macro level, you have to understand the basic unit of the brain, which is the neuron. So now that we've covered that, in this second lecture on chapter two, we're going to take a look at uh, the brain from a broader perspective, from a macro level, so to speak, because the neuron is a very micro level view of the brain. But let's zoom out a little bit to, to looking at some of the structures that compose the brain and how they work together uh, globally. So the, the first thing that I wanna say about understanding the layout of the brain is that it's not an extremely new idea that different parts of the brain have different responsibilities. That's a hypothesis that scientists and pseudoscientists and even philosophers have been uh, debating for hundreds of years. I, I would say the most recent pre-scientific example of this would be uh, the field of, of phrenology, which is now considered a pseudoscience. And I actually have a phrenology map of a human head in my office at work. Uh, but here you, you can see a picture of it in the, the top picture in this slide. The phrenologists, and I would say the most famous of the phrenologists was a, a gentleman by the name of Franz Gall. Uh, he had quite a lot of Gall, didn't he? Anyway, uh, the most famous phrenologist was a, a guy by the name of Franz Gall, Frenchman, I believe, who uh, popularized this idea that you could surmise things about a person's personality and about their intelligence and about their character by taking measurements of the person's head, particularly the skull, the cranium. Uh, and the phrenologists devised these various types of measuring machines that could be used to purportedly create readouts of a person's personality. And this was all the rage during the 1800s, even up until maybe even the, the early 1900s. This, you know, this, this was the the, the sort of thing that you might see at a county fair or something like that. It, but some folks actually took this really seriously. And phrenology was seen as a way that you could actually go about measuring personality and intelligence and that sort of thing. And again, it was based upon this idea that, that, you, could, that you could infer these things about the size of a person's head because of the size of a person's head would give you a clue as to uh, the relative sizes of the different regions of that person's brain. And the phrenologists did believe that different parts of the brain had different responsibilities. So for example, if you look at this phrenology map that's shown in this slide, you see the area in the back of the head there. Uh, that's what we now know, know as the occipital lobes. But the phrenologists believed that this back part of the brain was responsible for domestication or domestic ability. So apparently if you were 
looking for a spouse who was going to make a really good housewife, you know, you might want to get someone who scored high in that, that area of their, the size of their skull or, or whatever, right? You can see how this is kind of ridiculous sounding now, but the idea was that different parts of the brain could be, uh, their, their size and strength could be inferred by taking these measurements of the skull, uh, which we now know is completely ridiculous. But there was one kernel of truth that the phrenologists did have on their side. And that is the idea that different parts of the brain have different uh, responsibilities. The, the most current understanding that we have now from neuroscience is that in fact, different parts of the brain do have different responsibilities. They do different jobs. They have different personalities, so to speak. Now the idea that you can make inferences about these parts of the brain from measuring the size of a person's head, that's you know complete flim flim. But, uh, but this idea that different parts of the brain had different responsibilities, this was the one kernel of truth from phrenology that has stayed with us. Uh, I, I would say that the vast bulk of our scientific understanding of the brain really came for many years from studying the brains of people with different types of brain damage. Sorry about that, I needed to step away for a second. Okay, we'll get our slides pulled back up here. As I was saying, uh, much of what we learned about the brain in the early years of neurology and neuroscience were the result of studying unfortunate patients who had sustained different types of brain damage. Uh, one of the most famous cases from the 1800s involves uh, a case from the, uh, the neurologist Brokaw. And Brokaw <clears throat> had a patient who had had a massive stroke in the left frontal lobe of his brain. And the stroke had resulted in this patient only being able to say one word, and that was the word ton, T-A-N, ton. And all the patient would say over and over again after the stroke was ton, ton, ton. So this patient became known as patient ton. And after patient ton passed away, his neurologist Brokaw uh, removed the brain of this patient and preserved it. And it's still preserved in a museum to this day. And uh, you can see the actual brain there in that black and white photograph. And this area of the brain uh, that Brokaw studied uh, that was damaged by the stroke, which you can see there, uh, plain as day, you can see the, the area of the brain that was destroyed by the stroke. You can see that uh, that part of the brain was, was devastated by the stroke. And Brokaw surmised that since that patient had, lose the, he had lost the ability to speak, that that uh, part of the brain must be involved in speech. And his hypothesis turned out to be true. Now we have countless uh, cases over the years that have been studied uh, among patients who have damage to that precise part of the brain. And uh, like clockwork, it, you, I can guarantee you if, if a patient has that particular part of their brain damaged by a stroke or other type of brain damage, their ability to speak will be severely negatively affected by that stroke. And you, you can count on that. So that part of the brain became known as Brokaw's area. This is one of those early areas of the brain that was precisely mapped out due to studying uh, someone who had some form of severe brain damage. Another famous case is the, the case of Phineas Gage, which we'll talk about uh, later. Uh, but Phineas Gage was a patient who back in the 1800s was a railroad worker who had uh, accidentally due to an explosion, he had a railroad spike go through the top of his head. And this caused an extreme uh, loss of ability in terms of Phineas's ability to control his own emotions. And in fact, I think I have a video about the Phineas Gage case that I've shared with you guys on the Canvas page. Uh, so with cases like Phineas Gage, cases like uh, patient Ton and others, uh, 
uh, there slowly emerged this picture of the brain uh, that was informed by studying brain damaged patients. And this is a long tradition in neurology and in neuroscience. We learn much about the brain by studying patients who have sustained some severe form of brain damage. Uh, now the brain is a lot more plastic than we used to believe. Now, when I say we, I mean the royal we as neuroscientists and neurologists. It used to be believed that if you had a stroke or some form of severe brain damage that you know, you'd probably be basically screwed for the rest of your life, for lack of a better word. But uh, emerging evidence over the years has shown that the brain is a lot more malleable and can adapt to these sorts of insults uh, to a greater degree than we previously realized. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to be affected by that injury for the rest of your life. But to some degree, the brain has displayed uh, an uncanny ability to rewire itself due to experiences. And this is what's come to be known as neuroplasticity, which is another uh, term that I'll probably mention again in a later slide. But we've learned much about the brain through studying these brain damaged patients. The downside to learning about the brain through studying brain damaged patients is the fact that you have to wait for brain damaged patients to come along before you can study a particular part of the brain. So let's say there's a particular spot in the frontal lobes that I wanna study and I wanna know how damage to that part of the brain affects behavior and how that part of the brain affects the mind, what role it plays. I've gotta wait for some patient to come along who has brain damage to that specific area. I may wait my entire career and never see a patient who has damage to that particular area. So that's the downside to that. You can't just go around intentionally damaging humans' brains uh, to see what happens. That would be vastly unethical. Now we do it to animals all the time. We call them brain lesioning studies where we'll intentionally damage uh, the brains of animals to see how it affects their behaviors. And uh, that's something that's routine. And if, you, know, uh, you may have ethical issues about that regarding the treatment of animals, but that is a routine part of uh, neuroscientific research that that's just a fact of the matter so uh, you know we learn a lot through studying brain damage but there are limits to what we can learn about the brain through brain lesioning studies of animals or through studying uh, brain damaged people so thankfully we have methods that allow us to image and study the brain that do not rely upon the presence of brain damage uh, three of the most well-known uh, that your textbook talks about are shown here in this slide. Probably the most widely relied upon uh, method would be electroencephalogram, which is an EEG. But with an electroencephalogram, you're studying the brain's electrical activity to stimuli. So you hook someone's head up to a bunch of electrodes like you see in the top picture there. There's this sticky goo that they put on your head to make uh, the signals more readable. But these electrodes measure brain activity in different areas of the brain. Uh, and they create this graph like you see there on the right in that top picture. And it, there's ups and downs. The graph, the graph spikes up and down depending on, on how electrically active your brain is. So you can present different stimuli, whether it's a photograph or a flashing light bulb like a strobe light. And you can see how the brain reacts to that in terms of electrical activity and you can see which parts of the brain are more active than others when that particular stimulus occurs. And this is a tried and true method in neurology and in neuroscience. EEG has been around for years. If you ever do a sleep study, for example, you'll probably have EEG readings taken. If you suffer from epilepsy or other type of seizure disorder, you've probably had EEG readings taking at some, taken at some point during your diagnosis and treatment by your neurologist. Uh, EEG is a fine way, fine way to measure brain activity. And it's been around for a long time and it's relatively uh, inexpensive compared to how expensive a method like fMRI would cost. So the upside to EEG is it's reliable and it's relatively inexpensive uh, machinery to run as a lab. The downside to EEG is that it does not give you an actual image of the brain. It just shows you a picture of how active the brain is, but it doesn't give you a picture of the brain's anatomy. 
if you want a picture of the brain's anatomy in addition to its activity, in other words, if you want structure and function, then you want to go to an fMRI method, which is functional magnetic resonance imaging. So it gives you an image of the actual structure of the brain, but also the different color codings, which are constantly changing. It's a live changing video feed. Uh, the different colors indicate which parts of the brain are more active. So if there's a tumor or any sort of structural abnormality, then an fMRI can give you a picture of any of those structural issues. If there's a tumor in place or there's been some sort of brain damage, you can see that uh, in the image, but it also gives you information on the activity levels of different parts of the brain to look at how active different parts of the brain are compared to each other. Uh, and you, you, can, you can take fMRI readings during all sorts of activities. You would be really surprised. There are fMRI studies of of people meditating all the way to people having sex, just to look at you know, what parts of the brain are active during these different types of activities. Now, don't ask me how they managed to get fMRI images of, of uh, individuals engaged in sexual behavior. It seemed like that would be a tricky thing to capture, but apparently it's been done. So, uh, so fMRI is very advantageous because it gives you structure and function. The downside to fMRI is it's prohibitively expensive to do. Most university psychology labs cannot afford to house an fMRI machine. Usually if they wanna rely on fMRI research, they have to uh, go uh, to uh, something like a hospital and, uh, and, and rent the machinery or something like that. A very, very cost prohibitive sort of equipment to use. Uh, the other technology that's mentioned in your slide here is transcran transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is a method where you can use magnets to activate, in other words, to stimulate or to actually inhibit different parts of the brain. And uh, it's basically like turning part of the brain off with a magnet. And you can see how it affects the, first, the person's behavior. It's, it's kind of cool what they're able to do with this. In fact, uh, if you want to know what it's like to have a stroke to Brokaw's area, now all you have to do is go into a lab that has a TMS machine, and they can zap your Brokaw's area with the magnet. And as long as that magnet is turned on, you will not have the ability to speak. Uh, however, uh, once the, the magnet is, is turned off, you get your ability to speak right back like you never lost it. It's, it's really kind of crazy what they can do with these, um, with these magnets, with TMS. And uh, th these are some of the more well-known methods. There, there are certainly other methods out there like CAT scans, for example, which are basically just 3D x-rays. Uh, there are SPECT scans. I don't know as much about SPECT scans, but EEG, fMRI, and TMS are three of the major imaging methods that your textbook talks about that allow us to study the brain uh, without having to rely upon brain damage, which is a good thing. All right, so uh, now what I would like to do is look at the three major neighborhoods of the brain, so to speak. A lot of brain anatomy textbooks divide the brain into these three broad neighborhoods, if you will. At the very bottom of the brain, we have the structures of the hindbrain, uh, principally the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. And the hindbrain is, for the most part, involved with regulating processes of survival and also basic movement processes. So here in the hindbrain, you have the three major, uh, the three major structures. You have the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. So the medulla is the hindbrain structure at the top of the spinal cord. It controls survival functions such as breathing and heart rate. These are autonomic processes. Uh, you also have the pons, which is above the medulla. 
uh, and it regulates sleep and arousal cycles, and it also coordinates uh, the movements of the left and right sides of the body, so that's a very important function. And then you have the large structure of the cerebellum, which is located directly behind the brainstem, and it is essential for coordinating movement. So the three major structures of the hindbrain are the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. And uh, you, you see those shown here. All right, at the next level up is the midbrain. We don't talk about the midbrain uh, too much in this class, but there, there is one major structure of the midbrain that I want you guys to be familiar with. The major structure of the midbrain is a structure called the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra you see highlighted in green here in this slide. So the substantia nigra is the principal structure of the midbrain, and that is Latin for black body, because uh, substantia, that means body, and nigra means black. So substantia nigra is Latin for black body, and it's called the black body because it is filled with these dopaminergic neurons. These are neurons that operate using the uh, neurotransmitter dopamine, which is, black to the naked eye. Large quantities of dopamine create a black, a dark shade to the naked eye. So in a, in a person who passes away normally, if you dissect the brain, the substantia nigra uh, shows up as black. Uh, however, in a person who's died from Parkinson's disease, the substantia nigra has practically disappeared. These are the principal dopamine uh, producing neurons of the midbrain. And they're also critical for voluntary motor movement. And in fact, when the, uh, the neurons of the substantia nigra start to die off, then you start to see the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which is a uh, movement disorder and also a neurodegenerative brain disorder that is characterized by the death of the cells of the substantia nigra deep within the midbrain. Uh, and the loss of these dopamine producing cells causes the person to lose the ability to uh, voluntarily engage in, in muscle movement. So that's the main thing that I want you guys to know about the midbrain is that the midbrain is, uh, is dominated by the structure called the substantia nigra and it is crucial to voluntary muscle, muscle movements and the death of this structure is essentially the disease called Parkinson's disease, which fortunately many of us might be familiar with. All right, so we have, uh, we've talked a little bit about the hindbrain you see here at the bottom involving survival function and movement. We've talked a little bit about the midbrain, uh, but now I want to spend the rest of this lecture talking about the structures of the forebrain. Because as you see here in this, slide, the forebrain is the largest part of the brain, and the forebrain itself has two sub-neighborhoods, if you will, two subdivisions uh, within the larger neighborhood of the forebrain. So deep within the forebrain, in the middle of the forebrain, you have the structures of the limbic system, which are critical for the production of emotion uh, and motivation. Uh, and then outside, uh, on the outer layer of the forebrain, you have the layer called the cerebral cortex. So let's break down the structures of the forebrain uh, a little bit more uh, for the remainder of this lecture and look at the role of the limbic system in producing emotions and the role of the cerebral cortex in regulating those emotions. All right, so let's take a look at the forebrain. All right, so as I was saying, the forebrain is comprised of two major areas, the cerebral cortex and the limbic system, which your textbook refers to as 
the five subcortical structures. But the most common parlance that you will hear is for those subcortical structures to be referred to as the limbic system by, by most neuroscientists. So the outer layer of the brain is the cerebral cortex. And that's the part of the brain that's visible to the naked eye if you take a brain out of someone's head. Uh, but the inner layer underneath the cerebral cortex, beneath the cortex, hence the subcortical structures, this is what's called the limbic system. And uh, we're gonna start by talking a little bit about the limbic system because it's the more primal set of structures within the forebrain. And then we'll talk a little bit about the cerebral cortex. All right, so the inner layer of the forebrain is what's known as the limbic system. And it is composed of the five cortical, uh, cortical <laughs> the five subcortical structures called the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. Also the basal ganglia, the five cortical, five subcortical structures. All right, so your thalamus, we'll learn a little bit more about in the chapter on sensation and perception. We'll see in that chapter that the thalamus is basically the relay station for your senses in the brain. All of your senses, with the exception of smell, are first routed through the thalamus. When, they, when those, uh, that sensory information, when those projections from your sensory organ enter the brain, they first enter through the thalamus before being rerouted to the, to the higher levels of the brain. And uh, the exception to this is smell. We'll talk more about this in the chapter on sensation and perception. But for now, you need to know that the thalamus is the sensory relay station for the brain. Uh, the second structure, the hypothalamus, is uh, highly involved in regulating uh, basic motivated behavior. So this is a really polite term that you will hear for uh, what are commonly referred to as the four F's, fighting, fleeing, uh, fornicating, what was the fourth F? Maybe it was just three F's, fighting, feeding, fleeing. Yeah, fight, flight, feeding, and fornicating, the four F's. So these are the types of behaviors that are highly influenced by your hormonal system. And the hypothalamus actually runs the hormonal systems in your body. It's in charge of all your glands and all of those hormones that affect behaviors like aggression, like appetite, like sexual arousal, like fear response. All of these hormones are regulated and run ultimately by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus plays a massive role in shaping these basic motivated behaviors, as we call them, which you might remember as the four Fs, uh, fighting, fleeing, feeding, and fornicating. Okay, so that's the hypothalamus. The next structure of the limbic system that I wanna talk about is essential to memory processes. And this is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is essential for the recording of new memories. Interestingly enough, it's not the hippocampus where these memories are actually stored. New memories are not actually stored in the hippocampus, but it's the hippocampus that is responsible for them getting stored. Most long-term memories are, are stored elsewhere in the brain in areas like the temporal lobes, for example. But you have to have your hippocampi working properly uh, in order for that information to make its way into long-term memory. So although the hippocampus itself is not the location of the long-term storage of most memories, uh, nevertheless, the hippocampus is needed in order for those long-term memories to make their way to their eventual destinations in the brain, like the temporal lobes, for example. So the hippocampus is ab absolutely critical uh, for the formation of new memories, and it's also associated with certain motor memories as well. The amygdala is a structure located on the, the tip of the hippocampus, actually. Uh, you have two amygdala, two hippocampi, one on each side of the brain, 
and there's a lot of duplication. A lot of times you will see this with most of the brain structures, you have one of each on each side of the brain. So you have one hippocampus on each side, you have one amygdala on each side. And the amygdala is responsible uh, also to a large degree for uh, fear and anger responses. So the, um, the hypothalamus, which we talked about, is involved in those processes as well. But the amygdala plays a particularly strong role when it comes to anger and fear. So the amygdala plays a pivotal role in regulating those two particular emotions of anger and fear. And in fact, damage to the amygdala can disrupt those emotional responses to a, a significant degree. And finally, the fifth structure of the uh, limbic system is the basal ganglia, which is a dopaminergic structure, meaning that it operates using the, the neurochemical dopamine, just like the midbrain structure of the substantia nigra, which relies upon dopamine. The basal ganglia relies upon dopamine as well. So the basal ganglia is also part of the circuit that manages motor movements. And uh, if you have Parkinson's disease, uh, the basal ganglia and the uh, substantia nigra, which normally talk to each other, uh, to, to manage your voluntary muscle movements, that process gets disrupted and it, due to that damage to the substantia nigra. So the basal ganglia is part of that network that the substantia nigra is part of that manages voluntary muscle movements. But in addition to that, uh, that the role that the basal ganglia plays in movement, it's also heavily involved in feelings of reward. So anytime that you do something pleasurable, you get this massive dopamine release. Maybe you've heard about this before. This is becoming a, a really well-known fact, even uh, outside of psychologists. A lot of us are aware of the fact that dopamine plays a role in pleasurable feelings. Anytime you do something that feels good, you get this massive dopamine release. The problem, though, is that not all things that feel good are good for you, right? So this is where addiction can rear its, its ugly head. And often uh, you see uh, the basal ganglia playing a role in many of the processes at the level of the brain that lead to addictions, to things like substances or to gambling or to sex or to alcohol, you name it. Uh, what all of these different behaviors and substances have in common is they, they cause this massive dopamine release. And dopamine is heavily involved in addiction processes. And our understanding of the biology of addiction is heavily rooted in the role that dopamine plays, in particular in the limbic system, the structures of the basal ganglia. So those are the five principal structures of the limbic system. And here we have a view of the limbic system that I've been talking about. So deep in the center of the brain, uh, beneath the cerebral cortex there, you see uh, it's above the midbrain though. So when I say in the center of the brain, I don't want you guys to confuse the limbic system with the midbrain. Technically, the midbrain is basically just the substantia nigra. But right above the midbrain, between the midbrain and the cerebral cortex, you have the five structures of the uh, limbic system that I've been talking about here. You have the hypothalamus, you have the amygdala, you have the hippocampus, you have the thalamus and the basal ganglia, uh, whose roles I have just been discussing. And you also see here that situated directly above the limbic system is the cerebral cortex. So you can think of the cerebral cortex as being the most recent addition to the human brain in terms of evolutionary processes. In fact, it is the cerebral cortex that allows us to have all of the uniquely human abilities that we possess. Language, the ability to control our emotions, our imminently social nature, all of these human capacities are the result of the activity and the capabilities of the cerebral cortex, which are that uniquely large, um, at least in humans, 
uniquely large part of the brain in humans. All right. So the outer layer of the cerebral, uh, rather the outer layer of the brain is referred to as the cerebral cortex, like I've been discussing. And this part of the brain is divided into two halves, left and right hemispheres. Interestingly enough, we'll see in the next chapter that the left and right sides of the brain seem to have different personalities and different responsibilities. And we'll talk about the split brain research uh, that was conducted uh, by one of the authors of your textbook, uh, Gazaniga. Uh, but for now, just be aware of the fact that the brain is divided into left and right hemispheres and that uh, the different sides seem to have different uh, capabilities and different tendencies, although that's a little bit of an oversimplification and generalization. It's true for the most part, and we know this from split brain research. Uh, so in addition to having a left and right side, the cortex also has four lobes on each side. We have the occipital, parietal, temporal, and frontal lobes. So I wanna talk a little bit now about the role that these various lobes play at shaping our behavior and our mental processes. So I'm mainly gonna focus on the image on the left side of the slide for the purposes of this conversation. On the right, you see some more fine-grained areas that are particularly specialized for different processes and behaviors. But I particularly, uh, because this is an intro level course, I particularly want you guys to have a basic understanding of the four lobes of the cerebral cortex. So we'll start at the back in the area that's highlighted in yellow in your slide there on the left, uh, the occipital lobe. So the occipital lobes, again, you have one on each side of the brain, the occipital lobes are dedicated to processing visual input. In fact, the occipital lobes are known as the primary visual cortex of the brain. And in fact, in the uh, chapter on sensation and perception, you will hear me refer to the occipital lobes as the primary visual cortex. We say primary because there are secondary areas where visual input is processed in the brain as well. But the primary area where the vast bulk of visual processing is completed is in the occipital lobes there in the back of the brain where vision is processed. Uh, and then you move towards the temples there highlighted in green. You have the temporal lobes right behind the temples, hence temporal lobes. These, uh, the temporal lobes, are responsible for processing auditory input. That makes sense because they're right behind our ears, but also for storing long-term memories as well. And we'll talk more about both of those things, both memories and uh, the, the process of hearing uh, in later chapters as well. But for now, know that the temporal lobes are involved in storing long-term memories and processing auditory input. Move to the top of the brain here in the area that we see highlighted in purple, uh, kind of the top of the head towards the back. This is what's known as uh, the parietal lobes. The parietal lobes are involved in managing our sense of touch. The very front part of the parietal lobes, as you see in the second figure, is called the somatosensory cortex. So if you look at the second figure, that area that's highlighted in purple there, that strip, that's the primary somatosensory cortex, and that's the strip of cortex at the front end or the anterior edge of the parietal lobes that is responsible for our generating our sense of touch. There's an entire map of our body there located on that strip. And in fact, if you stimulate that part of the brain with an electrode, you can have the person hallucinate that they're being touched. Uh, very uncanny. Uh, so the, the parietal lobes manage our sense of touch our sense of body awareness, our spatial awareness, our map of the world around us, our awareness of what is self and not self. So for example, I know that this microphone right here is not part of my body, uh, but my hand is, right? So this is self and this is not self. And it is having a functioning set of parietal lobes that allow us to have this awareness of self and not self. And in fact, certain hallucinogenic drugs 
and even meditation practices can disrupt activity in the parietal lobes and give people the sensation that they are literally one with everything, right? You will hear Buddhists talk about being one with everything, for example, or even sometimes you'll hear about folks who are taking LSD or mushrooms talk about these experiences where they feel like they're one with everything. And this is believed to be because activity in the parietal lobes are disrupted, uh, is disrupted by, by the drug or by the meditative activity, and it causes a loss of sensation of, of being separate from the world around you. That's one hypothesis, at least. So uh, the parietal lobes involved in touch, involved in spatial awareness, involved in awareness of self and not self, our map of the world around us, this is all, and our map of our own body. Uh, the parietal lobes are highly concerned with maps and awareness of, of location. Uh, the frontal lobes, as you move towards the front of the brain here, highlighted in blue, this is a particularly gargantuan frontal lobe. Other mammal species, other primates, for example, even dogs and cats, they possess frontal lobes, but not at nearly the size of a human being's. I mean, the, the, the difference proportionality is just, I mean, you, could, you can measure it, but it is an extremely huge frontal lobe. In fact, uh, our huge frontal lobes are the reason why uh, childbirth was so, has been so difficult and dangerous for women over the years. And now we have methods such as C-section and, and stuff like that to help this along. But many births uh, resulted in the death of the mother and or the child because the child would just get stuck in there, right? Because the human head is so large. Uh, so that's because we have these huge frontal lobes. We need these huge heads to accommodate this giant frontal lobe that we have and our ability to speak, our ability to regulate our emotions, our ability to be social and understand the feelings of other people. All of these seemingly unique human abilities, or at least the level at which we possess them seems to be unique. All of these uniquely human abilities seem to, the, seem to be the result of the activity of the frontal lobes and us just having such huge frontal lobes, so to speak. So this, you might say, is the most uh, evolutionary new part of the brain, if you will, and it's the part of the brain that is responsible for um, allowing us to have the unique human abilities that, that at least seem to be unique, at least the species that exist on this planet. So it's the most sophisticated part of the brain, and, uh, and, and it's located at the very front, hence frontal lobes. Uh, so I, I mentioned that that we have these two sides of the cortex. We have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. They are separated by a bundle of axons called the uh, corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is a bundle of axons that's located between the left and right hemispheres uh, of the cerebral cortex, and it allows the two sides of the cortex to communicate with each other. In fact, they're kind of like two separate little brains on the, the uh, left and right side of the cortex. But the corpus callosum allows the, these two sides of the cortex to communicate with each other. It's a bundle of about uh, a million axons. Uh, and we talked about what axons are in the previous lecture, but it's a bundle of about a million of them that connect the two sides of the cortex and allow them to communicate with each other. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned, there have been a number of studies that have been done on, on what are called split brain patients. These are folks who have had their corpus callosum severed uh, to control their epilepsy. And we can see from those cases just how important the corpus callosum is. But it's also uh, these split brain patients have, have given us kind of a window into the unique personalities of the two different sides of the brain. And I'll talk more about this in chapter three uh, when we talk about split brain patients as it pertains to the topic of consciousness, which is our next chapter. So I'll say more about that in the next chapter. But just know for now that the two sides of the cortex are connected by this bundle of, of about a million axons called the corpus callosum.
Again, I, I talked about the various lobes of the cortex, and I already talked about these when we were looking at the image of the cortex, but here are some slides that just reiterate. You have the occipital lobes involved in processing primarily visual input. You have the, pri the, pi uh, the parietal lobes, sorry, I can't talk today. You have the parietal lobes involved in creating the map of your body and the world around you and generating our sense of self-awareness. You have the temporal lobes involved in long-term memories and auditory processing. And you have the frontal lobes involved in language and self-control and social behavior, rational thought, attention, planning, all of these higher order cognitive abilities uh, seem to be highly associated with the activity of the frontal lobes. So again, I talked about the fact that the frontal lobes and human beings are gargantuan. In fact, to put the precise proportionate, the precise number on the proportion, it's 30% of your brain's volume uh, and mass is the prefrontal cortex. So that is a massive chunk of the brain that is de dedicated to us being able to control our emotions, plan our behaviors, engage in rational thinking, and communicate with other people. All of these parts of the frontal lobes are all of, the frontal lobe is involved in all of these processes, rather, is what I'm trying to say. So, an, an incredibly important brain structure in terms of our human abilities, the things that make us uniquely human. We started to really learn about the importance of the frontal lobes due to a very famous case, a now famous case, of a railroad worker by the name of Phineas Gage. And I mentioned him earlier in the chapter and promised to come back to him. And at this point, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and come back to that case. So Phineas Gage was a railroad worker. He, I believe he was an Irish immigrant, if I'm not mistaken, uh, working on the railroads, I wanna say in the 1850s was when this accident occurred. Phineas was uh, a foreman of a railroad crew. And there was an unfortunate accident a couple of his men were horse playing around and accidentally detonated some dynamite that was sitting around. And this sent a railroad spike flying through the air and through Phineas's head. Poor Phineas, as you can see here in this image, he had his head perforated by this railroad spike that was sent flying through the air by this dynamite explosion. And it went straight through his cheek and out the top of his head. So basically, his frontal lobes were completely uh, obliterated by the passing of the, the tapping iron, which was the, the type of spike that went through his head. The tapping iron went straight through his frontal lobes, and the effects of this on his behavior were immediate and profound. It's amazing that Phineas actually survived this, considering that it was in the 1850s and most people who would have had an injury like this, if they weren't killed instantly, would have at least died quickly from an infection. But nonetheless, uh, Phineas survived, did not succumb to infection, and I believe he lived another 15 to 20 years after the accident occurred. But there were profound impacts on his personality. Uh, he he had a lot of loss of his sense of control over his emotions. He, he lost a lot of his emotional self-control, his ability to be rational, his ability to get along with other people was severely, severely limited, and his language ability was negatively affected as well. So he had all of these profound defects in emotional regulation and interaction with other people, and it, it really negatively impacted him for a lot of his life after the incident. Now, some accounts say that he eventually was able to come back a little bit of, from this injury. And I, I read one account that said that he eventually was able to get a job after this as a stagecoach driver. Uh, so he was able to hang on to some of his mental abilities, but he lost a lot of his emotional self-control. So you, you see 
an early case that really started to give us an idea of what the frontal lobes did and how important they were. And in fact, it was this case that is credited as often being the earliest case that started to clue us in into just how important the frontal lobes are when it comes to regulating our emotions and getting along with other people and using language. So here we see a, a blown up image of what we were just looking at. You see Phineas Gage himself actually holding the tapping iron that went through his own head. And uh, that iron itself is uh, preserved in a museum to this day. And you can actually see an image of where the tapping iron is believed to have gone through his head. This was put together by a, a neurologist by the name of Antonio Damasio, who's famously uh, done a lot of work on historically deconstructing this case. And uh, Damasio has somewhat made a career for himself by analyzing this one case of, uh, of Phineas Gage. And he's written a lot about it, and I, I've read some of his work on it. It's very fascinating stuff. Okay, so the last term that I want to talk about in this chapter before we close, I've already talked about it already. I just kind of wanted to reiterate that uh, there is a fair degree of plasticity to the brain. What this means is that even after injuries, after insults, the brain has this seeming ability to rewire itself to some degree. In fact, there's a great, uh, there's a great movie called The Brain That Changes Itself, which is on the topic of neuroplasticity which I might go ahead and uh, assign to you guys as an extra credit opportunity for those who are interested in that. But we used to believe that the brain was a lot more fixed than it really is, and that if you got an injury, that it was practically impossible to recover from. We now know that there is a certain degree of neuroplasticity, meaning that the brain does have, um, at least to some degree, the ability to rewire itself. And in fact, we now know that the brain is constantly rewiring itself in reaction to every single experience that you have. So you hear a lot of talk about neuroplasticity in current neuroscience circles. It's a hot topic because uh, it, it's only been really recently in the last couple of decades that we've really started to acknowledge that the brain is as malleable as it actually is. This is, this is an aspect of the brain and our understanding of the brain, at least, that has been changing in recent years. Okay, so that's going to be it for Chapter 2. Uh, stay tuned for the Chapter 3 lecture. I, I don't know yet whether that's going to be divided into uh, two sub-lectures like I've done with the first two chapters. It probably will be, although it could be the case that I, I do it all in one. We will see how it goes. I hope that these recorded lectures are helpful for you guys. Please do shoot me some comments. Uh, I have the comments open on YouTube for feedback on these recorded lectures, how I could make them better. I hope that they're helping you guys, and I will see you guys for chapter three.